it later or for those for those who are not um, able to attend today. And that will be posted on our YouTube channel. So it's the WPN YouTube channel and our Washington Passport Network uh, our web, uh, network website as well. Um, you may notice we're not in the typical webinar format. We're in a meeting format, and that is intentional. We want to encourage questions and participation. So if you have a question that's about something that Emily and I um, are speaking to at that moment, please raise your virtual hand. Um, um, thank you to Giselle, our admin assistant with the team, and to Megan Gold with the Northwest Coastal Team of CSF for helping today. They'll be watching for that. So if Emily or I don't see the hand, they can help point that out and we can answer the question in real time. If you have more general questions, you can put them in a the chat and we will have time at the end to address questions. And so I also wanted to just share that with the bills that we track and um, and in some cases uh, support, in other cases monitor, um, you can, if you're curious, view those with our external bill tracker um, and some other resources that are on our um, external advocacy Google Drive. And both of those links will be dropped in the chat at the end of the webinar, as well as this deck. So you don't have to be taking notes, you'll have access to the deck. Um, and again, those links will be dropped at the end. Next slide, please. So introductions for those of you who we may not have met yet. I am Juliet Schindler, I use she, her pronouns, and I serve as the Executive Director of Public Affairs and Strategic Partnerships at College Success Foundation. I actually just had my 10th year anniversary. Um, so, um, I've been doing this work for some time and really loving it. And um, I oversee our, uh, our government relations, we're public private partnership as I'm well. I'm going to sit in on a webinar. Our, um, as well as oversee our um, passport contract and work. And I'll hand it off to my co presenter, Emily. Hello, everyone. My name is Emily Stochel. I also use she, her pronouns, and I'm the program manager of government relations and advocacy here at CSF. I've been here for a little over two years, but um, I am moving on uh, from this role on Friday, and I'll drop my like um, personal email in the chat in case anyone wants to stay connected. I saw the note that my audio is going in and out. I'll speak uh, as loudly and clearly as I can, but um, just raise your hand if you if you can't hear me and I need to repeat something. Next slide, please. So for a little bit of context, um, the the work we do that I oversee at CSF around legislative affairs and advocacy, um, there's really like the buckets of our advocacy principles and priorities are around post-secondary access and completion and student support with with focus being our mission population. And the CSF mission population are students who are uh, come from low-income families, who um, the majority who uh, self-identify as students of color and who are um, the majority, again, are first generation in their family to attend college. So roughly three quarters of our students kind of fall into those categories. And then of course, with the, the passport work, that's kind of a subgroup of that population that we focus on which is students who have experienced foster care and or unaccompanied homelessness. So we do this through the, the continued public-private partnership, meaning that we do get state support, including through contracts such as this passport contract to do this work. Um, and what what I, I, this is kind of my language below that, that, it, that uses part of a CSF um, mission statement, but Really, the work we're doing in Olympia, we're striving to close the educational opportunity gap. And, and that language came from a Blue Ribbon Commission recommendation back in 2000 when CSF was founded, um, where that was kind of the goal was for a, a nonprofit statewide organization to work to close that educational opportunity gap that we all know exists. Um, and that is particularly um, an issue for this population we're speaking about today. And we do this in order to forge a just and equitable society. And so I, I also want to kind of make the link to the work we've been doing this past year with the Washington Passport Network. We had three different work groups and the one that I oversaw was an advising structure work group. Um, and you can see the two goals here. So as far as, um, as far as it comes to legislation, 
we want to make sure that passport leadership team and then more broadly giving access to WPN members to understand about the legislative process to have an opportunity if they are interested and 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 able to um, to follow legislation and even weigh in and support. And it's also very important and something we we focused on was to put into concrete steps how the PLT can give policy procedure and implementation recommendations to WASAC on the passport program because that is in statute. And that's one of the main roles of the PLT is to advise on the program because you all, the PLT members, are the experts. So um, just wanted to give that, that context to what we're doing. Next slide, please. So we're hoping you might be willing to have a little icebreaker um, interaction with us around, um, around the advocacy work. And you can see some questions here. Basically, just wondering if anyone, if some folks would share if you have testified in Olympia or lately. Um, and if you did, what was the experience like? Um, I, because I know having worked with folks over the years and trying to um, bring in um, bring in folks to, to support them to testify, it can feel really intimidating. And as I remind them, these are just people. These are people like you and me who are there because they, um, it's not because they're they're going to Olympia to get rich, believe me. They're there because they, they have strong opinions and things they want to change. Um, and they want to hear from people who know um, about whatever that topic is. Um, so what was your experience? Is And if not, if you haven't been involved, is there a concrete next step you, you would be interested in in taking to begin um, engaging in advocacy? Is there a barrier that feels like it exists for you? Would anyone be willing to share? We also had uh, members of the PLT uh, we had an in-person meeting <clears throat> uh, in Olympia in February um, for a professional development opportunity. So another option for any of you who joined that day was something you learned or were surprised by. Um, it was it was through Olympia Day and that our original plan had to be suddenly changed about where we were going to meet and what you know how how we were going to actually get access to legislators. So it was very much at a seat of your pants type of feeling, which happened. Um, if anyone wants to comment on that. I can share. Thank you. Yeah, I uh, actually was recently in Olympia um, with Washington Immigrant Solidarity Network, Placen, <clears throat> and I had an excellent experience. Um, we were down there advocating um, to secure around $25 million in the budget for like the newly arrived um, migrants and refugees that have come. So that was been really fantastic. I had a, like, everybody was really friendly, even like the security staff and everything um, made me feel really welcome. I felt listened to and heard. And yeah, the, um, we ended up securing it and they ended up passing it. So it was nice to have like a victory as well. Thank you so much. Is it Alyssa? Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else? Okay. Um, next slide, please. So, quick overview of today's agenda. Um, we're we're just going to come into a high level high level overview of the session and and highlights, um, and including the legislation that did pass that that's of interest. Uh, to the WPN because of the population we serve, other relevant bills um, to the population and, and you all, um, those those relevant bills that did not make it through, and then relevant items in the operating budget. And lastly, okay, session's over. And Next slide, please. So what is a quote short legislative session? The legislative sessions um, are set up in a biennium, a two-year, a two-year period, and and on the even years, the the long session 
um, 105 day session. So Janu they always start uh, the first Monday in January. They and then the long session goes through toward the end of April. Um, and the the main, you know, like what must be accomplished in that session is to write a two year budget. And they actually um, look at they look out four years, which is not true for most states. So that makes them even makes the legislators who are, who are working on the budget even more uh, focused on really being um, fiscally responsible. So they write that two year budget and um, and a large portion of that budget is not flexible. It's it's already um, meeting these different in, you know entitlements. Um, so it's it's kind of this small piece of the pie that really they have some flexibility over how they spend it. Just for some context at why it can be challenging. So then the even years, the shorter 60 day session. So what we call a short session um, is actually to write a supplemental budget. And the purpose of a supplemental budget is to say, you know, we wrote this budget last year, but then maybe something in the economy changed or um, some factors were in play that made um, that made us need to adjust the budget. The caseloads, whether it's for like the FHS or if, or what we're interested in also, the, the, um, the Washington College Grant utilization, things like that went up or down. So they need to adjust. Um, and usually, it's usually up. Um, that the, the the state agencies come and say, look, this is our needs now. We need this much more money. Um, but we also have um, folks like College Success Foundation, organizations like ours, um, who get state funding, who who have the opportunity to also come and make a case for why we need additional funds. Um, this year and in recent years, um, the process has been a little more efficient because it's one party control. So the House of Representatives, the Senate and the governor's office are all democratically controlled. Um, that means not only do they are they the lead on writing the budget, but they also um, are the ranking members in the committees. Um, they're the leadership. So when they come together to make decisions, um, including like in rules committee, which is the committee which helps decide what bills get to the floor to be to be debated and passed. Um, but I will say that um, this democratic leadership has been quite good about including their Republican leadership counterparts in some decision making, including with the budget. And that that doesn't always happen. And I think it's worth noting. Um, the fiscal environment this year was. I, I would I would say the general feeling was okay. Um, it, the rev, they all, the legislators always look at the revenue forecast that comes out four times a year. So the February revenue forecast is important because that's as they're making some final like getting ready to make some final decisions on the budget. And if it looks like the revenue is growing, then obviously that gives them a little more wiggle room with with the what they feel comfortable funding. Um, this year it was up, but the, the dollars were up, but not by very much. So it was um, not a deterrent, but it also didn't give a lot of encouragement to to, to do some, some bigger spending. So again, the purpose of the legislative session at its core, uh, a short one is to write and pass a supplemental budget. Um, in theory, they would, they would not have to pass bills, but of course, there's every every session. There's always hundreds of bills that are dropped, um, and most of them do not pass. And that is on purpose. That is how the system is set up. Bills have to go through a lot of hurdles, and that's so that they are good. Policy. And next next slide. So we are now going to walk through some bills that did pass get through all the hurdles I mentioned and that that um, are important to know for past, our, our population of passport eligible students. Next slide. Uh, so Senate Bill 5904 um, <clears throat> was um, sponsored by um, Senator Nobles became the chair of higher education and workforce development in the Senate <clears throat> partway through the through the session. Um, and, and that's because her predecessor um, stepped aside so that she could run for Congress. 
So that was an interesting shift, but Senator Nobles was already on the committee, stepped right in. She's really respected and did a great job. And she also had some great bills that she was sponsoring. Um, and this bill um, would mean that a student that's eligible to receive an award for the Washington College Grant, College Bound, Passport to College, or Passport to Apprenticeships now has up to six years, which is 150% of the length of the student's program. Um, um, or the clock hour equivalent. And that's so that these um, state programs are aligned with federal programs. Most most um, well-known and probably important is the Pell Grant, the federal Pell Grant. And that makes it much more predictable and, and consistent for their for students and their families. Um, so they don't have to kind of try to be tracking these different financial aid deadlines, um, which did vary. And then another important note is it removed the that cap of the of the age 26 to expire for passport to careers. One reason I think it's important, um, those who work with apprenticeship uh, programs know that the average age is, you know, into the late 20s and 30s for those students. So um, so this is also a great um, thing and good for financial aid staff who are on campuses and, and had to deal with those different um, timelines. And then it was partially funded with one and one point five million dollars. Yes, Laura. <laughs> next slide, please. Great. So next we have Senate Bill fifty nine oh eight, and this is all around providing extended foster care services to youth ages eighteen to twenty one. This was um, a mockingbird priority for those are, that aren't familiar with mockingbird society. Um, all of the legislation that they come up with and kind of plans um, are developed in partnership with mockingbird chapter members that have lived experience in either foster care and or homelessness. So basically what this bill does is it now makes every 18 to 20 year old um, in extended foster care or sorry, who, uh, let's see, who like aged out of care, eligible for extended foster care between the ages of 18 to 21. So this is a huge move. Last year, uh, a similar bill was proposed. However, it was for the ages of 18 to 25. And um, I believe that kind of, it became more narrow in order to make smaller steps to ensure that we're working towards that bigger goal. So this is a piece of that, um, nonetheless, a huge accomplishment. Um, so, before, extended foster care was only available to young people who exited care that had an approved job, school plan, or home. And so that takes away that eligibility requirement in this bill. Um, any young person can participate, and it does incentivize those things. So um, that's part of the bill. And then part of DCOF's decision package, um, which also includes increasing the amount of supervised independent living or SIL subsidy and providing a housing stipend to young people. Um, this bill ensures that all dependent people, young people age 15 and older are aware of EFC. As we know, there tends to be a gap of, you know, young people knowing and being aware of these services. So this is huge as well. <laughs> this also ensures that the extended foster care financial subsidy is set at a rate matching or exceeding the level two foster care reimbursement rate for children 12 and older for those in an in independent living setting. And lastly, it requires the Department of Children, Youth and Families, otherwise known as DCYF, um, to create a payment system that will issue the uh, supervised independent living stipend to young people, even if the young person does not have a stable address. And through talking with um, the lobbyist of Mockingbird Society, Sam Martin, um, they did get enough funding to fully fund this bill, which is fantastic. So it was funded at $1.131 million. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, the next bill that we're talking about is Senate Bill 6053. Oh, and I'm sorry, this is Juliet's slide. I'll let you take it from here. Yeah, no worries. Um, Senator Woolley from the Spokane area uh, was the prime sponsor on this bill. And this was a, a continuation of um, some legislation that was proposed before, and then this kind of kept expanding it. Um, so basically, it, it's setting up data sharing agreements between WASAC and OSPI, and then, then sharing that with um, the higher ed institutions. And the idea is that uh, WASAC enters into the data sharing agreement with OSPI and, and that facilitates transfer 
of high school student directory information. And then OSPI makes that information that they collect from school districts avail available to WASAP. Um, so then the institutions of higher aid, of higher ed, sorry, is um, they can share uh, educational, but also post-secondary financial aid opportunities. So we want, the idea is to facilitate, you know, between the different institutions, um, information about students, letting students get information about, um, you know, uh, what what kind of opportunities are available at, at the different higher ed institutions, including in some cases like, you know, um, that you're already qualified. And, um, and then there's also a and some data sharing agreement information that is provided to the ERDC, so the Educational Resource Center, sorry, I'm forgetting the D, um, and about student enrollment and outcome information. Um, and, and the student, for those of you who are worried about uh, privacy, um, WASAC maintains the, the statewide student identifier for each student. Um, it also opens up that uh, not only the public higher ed institutions, but the nonprofits, um, not for profit, non public, not for profit institutions as well. So, for those of you who know the Independent Colleges of Washington, for example, this was something they asked and were able to get in the bill. Thanks, Laura. <laughs> data, of course, it's data is the D. Next slide, please. Great, so next we have um, House Bill 1970. Um, as most of you know, there is often a disconnect of communication between social workers and caregivers. And so this bill really addresses that. It's really um, the intent is to improve that communication um, and kind of standardize practices around that throughout the state with the department. So specifically, this um, bill requires the Department of Children, Youth and Families to establish a caregiver communication specialist position within the department um, for the purpose of improving communication between DCYF and caregivers caring for children receiving child welfare services, which is pretty broad spectrum. Um, and secondly, it requires DCYF to submit a report to the legislator by October 1st, 2025, describing how to implement an automated uh, notification system that would notify caregivers or children receiving child welfare services and providing recommendations regarding improving communications between DCYF and the caregivers. Um, so the amount funded for this was 86,000 of state funding plus 64,000 of federal funding. So uh, we also want to include a few other bills that we feel are relevant to, to uh, be aware of. Next slide. Great. So this bill felt important to include because by nature, youth experiencing foster care or homelessness have or are go going through a crisis just felt really important to acknowledge. And what this bill does essentially is it creates some nuances around the definition of a mental health professional and allows minors to receive services. So we did include some specific language from the bill report. Um, so first, it authorizes 23-hour crisis relief centers to serve non-adult clients, so minor clients, and establishes guidelines for centers serving this population. And it also aligns the definition of mental health professional for purposes of provisions governing treatment of minors with the definition applicable to the treatment of adults and makes other changes to incorporate references to these centers and similar facilities and current law provisions. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, next, we have House Bill 1929, which is also commonly referred to as the Bridge Program. Um, and this is about supporting young adults following behavioral, inpatient behavioral tr health treatment. Um, so what this bill does is it creates the post -inpa inpatient housing program for young adults to provide supportive transitional housing with behavioral health supports for persons 18 to 24 years, years old who are exiting inpatient behavioral health treatment. And it requires the healthcare authority to provide funding for community-based organizations to operate at least two residential programs with six to 10 beds each to serve participants for up to 90 days. 
So um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with North Star Advocates, but they are the leading uh, community-based organization with this bill. They've um, been doing a lot of the advocacy and will be contracted to help implement this program. Um, and for those of you who don't know, Jim Theophilus is the founder of that. Um, and he that might sound familiar because he also founded the Mockingbird Society. And he's been working with a team, including um, people with lived expertise, which is great. And in terms of the kind of the logistics about this program is that there's going to be um, like one residential program on each side of the mountain. So there'll be one on the east side and one on the west side, which is great. Um, and they do have enough. It was partially funded. However, um, due to kind of the specifics of the budget and the timeline, they will have enough money to fully implement this so that's great news. Great. So next we have House Bill 1541. And this is called this is about establishing the nothing about us without us act. That phrase might be familiar to some of you. Um, the phrase nothing about us without us is a mantra that has historically resonated with both the disability rights and foster care community. This um, bill is a little bit more specific to the disability rights community, but can also be applied in other areas. Um, but it's basically around advocating for full and direct participation in all decisions that impact like people's with lived experiences lives. Um, so this is also a part of user-centered design theory. So part of this bill um, implements certain membership requirements for statutory entities defined as any multi-member task force, work group, or advisory committee um, that is one, temporary, two, established by statute, three, established for the specific purpose of examining a particular issue that directly and tangibly affects a particular underrepresented population, and four, required to report to the legislator on that issue. This bill also requires various reports by statutory entities and the Office of Equity on the effectiveness of the membership requirements under the Act, among other information. And lastly, this bill requires the inclusion of the membership requirements under the Act in the Bill Drafting Guide. So, Part of this bill also specifically directs the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Work Group to include in its membership individuals with lived experience um, that are receiving behavioral health services or whose family members have received such services. Um, additionally, community health advisory boards are required to be broadly representative of the character of the community with the board's composition consisting of community members with lived experience in areas such as healthcare access and quality, healthcare inequities, and social and economic sectors. And this bill doesn't have a fiscal note because it is policy only. Okay. Um... So House Bill 2214, um, which was prime sponsored by Re Representative Slaughter and is known as the SNAP bill, but basically is an, uh, one of the efforts to streamline access for low income um, students or potential students to uh, the Washington College Grant. And basically the idea is um, to not keep asking low income residents to to keep having to fill out these forms and keep proving over and over again they're low income. So if they are eligible for um, the Washington Food Program or the federal program that's known as um, as SNAP, um, then then they are notified by WASAP that they are eligible for the Washington College Grant. So it removes some of these barriers and and potentially like a feeling of stigma around accessing state financial aid and makes it more streamlined. Um, and, and then just the technicality is the individuals participating in the public assistance programs would be shared by DSHS with WASAT um, and only to the extent allowable under state and federal law. And then there's a $239,000 um, funding amount to implement this. And I, and I would note to uh, this, um, the WASAC, big, big kudos to WASAC because every year I see how many things um, are put additionally on their plate through legislation. Sometimes they're funded and sometimes they're not. Um, so um, Don on the call and other our WASAC partners, like 
Thank you for all you do. Next bill, please. Uh, and this bill um, um, is about work study. And um, this is uh, included this partly because of the um, uh, nonprofit partners we have today on the call. So basically, um, it allows state work study public and nonprofit employers that want to increase that are you know focused on increasing post-secondary enrollment for high school students that they would be able to receive more than 80% reimbursement of the student wages for that work study student. Um, so again, it's, this is WASACs, the Office of Student Financial Assistance, um, and it allow, allows them this broader authority to implement the state work study. Um, and, and they can create and enter into contracts with employers and eligible institutions for, for the program. Um, and so that's exciting for those of us who are, you know, a public or nonprofit community service type employer. It gives us more access and gives these students um, some, you know, additional options to to explore and different opportunities. And this was partially funded at two hundred thousand dollars. Then um, dual credit um, is. Uh, something that we uh, CSF have, have focused on over the years, and I feel like there really has been a lot of attention in Olympia about increasing access to, you know, different forms of dual credit, uh, you know, including Running Start, College in the High School. Um, and the reason why it's priority for, for us at CSF is, you know, research has shown that students who um, engage in some form of dual credit tend to um, are more likely to go on to post-secondary and have uh, overall um, higher success when you know they whether it's because they're more prepared for post-secondary they you know it helps them just understand getting that mindset so um, so the key for us is encouraging and reducing barriers so um, this bill so there's been various bills and this one with rep paul is about notifications so the, it requires public high schools to notify students and their families about available du dual credit programs and, and any financial assistance available to reduce the cost of the programs. And other bills have stepped in to remove barriers around the cost. So um, because this is policy only, um, it doesn't require um, new notifications. Um, it doesn't require funding to implement it. So um, it's just saying school districts get that information out there. Next poll, please. So, um, so we also just wanna to touch on some of the relevant budget items. And I should specify when there are, when we're talking about budget today, we're talking about what's called the operating budget. And that's one that probably is most commonly um, on the radar of you all. Um, the operating budget is the one that runs all, all, all these different things um, that support the work not the other two are more specific. There's the capital budget, which is about actually funding, you know, brick and mortar. Um, so that if that is an issue for our higher ed institutions, for example, um, because they, they need those state dollars to do that. And then the transportation budget. Um, so all three budgets, when I said, you know, what, what has to happen in, in set legislative session, all three budgets have to be have to be written and passed. But again, today, um, and typically we're focused on the operating budget. Um, so the, the disappointing part of our presentation today is that the um, maintenance level, additional maintenance level funding for the Passport to Career programs was not fully funded. Um, the, the, the ask was 2 million and 1 million was funded. Um, so that is, um, you know, a a, um, a challenge that WASAC has been very focused on throughout the course of session and now. And for my um, WPN colleagues out there, you will be um, you will be hearing more about that from WASAC, and um, you know there will be conversations to be had. I should I should pause for a minute and and explain what um, when I say that WASAC asked for two and, and got the one. So what happens is each of the state agencies um, 
submit in the in the September usually by like mid September their ask for what they need for additional funding um, and it's called a decision package. Um, so in Wasac's decision package, this was one of the items where they said, you know, based on the projected number of, of additional passport eligible students, we need 2 million to keep up with that. And as many of you know, the reason the, that number has jumped quite a bit um, is because of the increase in unaccompanied homeless youth um, that the institutions have been identifying. Um, so I see Don has some additional information in the chat. And when we get to Q&A, um, if there's questions around that, we can address it at that point, please. Um, there was also an increase um, which was related to Senate Bill 6254 around financial aid certification, um, $425,000 there for the State Board of Community and Technical Colleges. An additional three million went to <clears throat> an office of superintendent of public instruction for the ninth grade success initiative. The ninth grade success program is um, in a number of schools, uh, high schools uh, around the state. Uh, we at CSF partner closely. Stanford Children is the one who um, who operates that, and it's because ninth grade is such a critical make or break year that um, this is backed by research that there's. Um, a, a number of components to the ninth grade success work, um, including help with kind of coursework and uh, making sure that there's, you know, not bias and identification for accelerated classwork and supports that are built in. So excited about that. And then one of the big focus of my work this session for CSF was the ask to support our Rally for College initiative. Um, this, um, High school programming work was begun during the pandemic with federal funds, and um, it allowed us to, we, we serve currently in 28 high schools around the state. They tend to be in five different regions, and these are high need schools based on their um, free reduced price lunch rates, their um, high school graduation rates, direct to college rates, and their student population. Um, so we were operating in a cohort model in these schools, and with the federal funds, we were able to expand to a whole school model, which is also known as targeted universalist model. And our early um, results from, we only had one year in full operation, our early results were really positive, including um, a 9% jump in the direct-to-college rate, and probably even higher, depending on how you compare our data to the statewide data. So our ask was to replace those federal funds with state funds um, and that we were not the only ones asking because there were a number of organizations that had received federal funds who were doing the same thing. So we were um, really pleased that we were able to get not all, but um, a bulk of that with the 3 million so that we can continue that work in these 28 high schools. Um, and I'll hand it off to Emily for some of the other budget items. Perfect, thank you. So next we have 1.984 million for the independent living services rate increase, which was fully funded, very exciting. Um, as some of you may know, the eligibility for independent living programs has broadened over the last few years or so. And so this really um, provides a rate incre increase that was needed in order to maintain independent living services at current capacity levels. So again, just growing with uh, the need. Next, um, 1.75 million for the Family Preservation Services rate increase was partially funded. And same similar sort of situation, um, a rate increase was needed in order to maintain the Family Preservation Service capacity at current level. And in theory, this, this helps prevent families from getting separated that um, can remain safe with just extra supports. The original requested amount was 2.9 million, so you can see it's only a portion of that, but um, thankfully they, they did get some money to continue going forth with that. Um, next, we have um, 1.771 million for the Mockingbird family model through the DS lawsuit compliance. And uh, if you aren't familiar with the Mockingbird family model, it basically works in constellations so that people in a certain area that are fostering are connected 
connected to other providers. And instead of you think you're having to go to a complete stranger's house for something like respite care, um, they actually get a built-in family. So instead they're spending time with like their auntie that they see every time during respite instead of a new person every time. So definitely um, a great model. And it's something that's been replicated um, all over the world, really. I just learned yesterday that in the UK, they have 145 constellations, which is huge. So this is really something that I can anticipate will grow here um, in the state um, throughout the next couple of years also. I know they'll be hiring new positions as well. So um, really exciting news about that. Lastly, um, we have 600,000 and ongoing ongoing funding for the Kinship Care Support Program, which was partially funded. Um, and this is a program that kind of encourages uh, youth in care to be placed with kin and relatives instead of also being in stranger foster care. Um, I believe Amara is doing a lot of this work um, as well as the child specific licensing. So that's exciting to see, uh, even though it was only partially funded, um, there is some ongoing funding, which is fantastic. A big budget item that you don't see here um, and is pretty controversial is um, for FRS, which is Family Reconciliation Services. And that request was for $7.084 million. This was not funded at all. Unfortunately, it was not in um, the governor's budget, nor the state or sorry, nor the Senate or the House or the final budgets. And this was a huge one. There were a lot of advocates that were working on this and really disappointed that this didn't make it into any of the budgets. Um, and this would help provide support so that families don't need um, intervention that would separate families, basically. So this is something that's definitely going to be worked on. Um, it's something we've talked ad nauseum about in Child Welfare Advocacy Coalition. So it sounds like this will be worked on in the next year also. Next slide, please. Thank you. So we also wanted to include some bills that didn't pass this session. Um, a lot of these will likely be revisited or have already been revisited in terms of, you know, them being introduced in previous sessions and trying again this year. And since they didn't pass, um, there's likely to be continued work on these things. So we'll start with um, Senate Bill 5591. This is Noble's bill, um, and this is about providing dependent youth with financial education and support. So what this bill would have done is um, make sure that minors in care have access to bank accounts and a small monthly stipend so that they can begin practicing financial management skills. Um, again, this is a legacy issue with Mockingbird and I would wager that, well, hopefully it would come up in, in um, sessions after this. So we'll keep an eye out for that. Um, next, we've got House Bill 2224. And this is all about the CPS investigations method and kind of just improving that process and the risk assessment. Um, as a lot of you may know, this the system that has been used has been used for a long time. It's definitely something that um, they're trying to incorporate new practices and new research into to improve it and make it more, more tangible and fitting for each situation. Um, and I do know that the department has already made some changes to this and sounds like a lot of this can happen administratively. So parts of this bill are being worked on still um, on an administrative level, but I wouldn't be surprised to also see this bill again next session. Next, we've got Senate Bill 5873, and this is also one that has been um, shown up in the past. This is around providing adequate and predictable student transportation. And this bill specifically has a small portion of it that talks about our population um, of students who are experiencing foster care and or homelessness and um, talks about kind of equitably providing transportation so that um, students can get to school in, in a more efficient way. So. Um, and then we also have House Bill 1045, and this is another repeat bill. Um, it's about universal basic income, and we've seen this modeled in different states, um, and it's shown to actually increase um, or improve poverty levels. So there's less people experiencing poverty, um, sometimes 
uh, people need that little extra support in order to get out of poverty. So it's really about providing um, a baseline amount of support um, to support those who are experiencing that. And then I'll pass it to Juliet for the rest of the bills on this. Uh, okay, um, Senate Bill 5896, also Senator Nobles. Um, and this one, I, I believe is, uh, it never really got into committee, wasn't really heard, but I believe this probably will not be back because it was about um, extending the term of eligibility of the college bound scholarship um, recipients to six years. And as we talked about earlier, that was accomplished with other legislation. So you do see this in session where you have different bills being dropped by different members, which are similar or, you know, might just be a little bit different. Um, and then one of them ends up being what we call the vehicle. Um, and then sometimes they're, they're actually companion bills, um, one in the House, one in the Senate. And again, only one final bill can pass. So there has to be, um, hopefully through a collaborative process, you know, a, a decision of, of what is the final bill. Um, and then um, Senate Bill 5999, um, and would, if passed uh, by Senator Hansen, would have increased eligibility um, as far as um, income uh, for the Washington College Grant up to 70% of median family income and modified the College Grant Award for students of, that are between 71 and 100% of median family income. And then those who are receiving the maximum college grant but are not college bound scholarship recipients, they would get a bridge grant. Um, so, and the idea there, and this was done in the past. So basically I think it was, it was Hanson trying to kind of continue this uh, more generous funding levels. And then this bridge grant, the idea of the non-college bound students getting the bridge grant is there's already a $500 stipend that's given to college bound recipients. So it's kind of balancing that out but um, did not pass this year. And then 5958 um, would establish a career grant skills program. Um, I don't have a lot of information on that. I suspect um, it had to do with funding, um, but it could very well be one that this, um, that, that Blanky would bring back again in the future. So there's plenty others. Cause like I said, most bills don't make it through the process. Um, so we just are giving you a little sample here. Next slide, please. So um, <clears throat> this year we um, ever, we have four quarterly meetings with the Passport Leadership Team. And I mentioned earlier that last February we had our in-person meeting and professional development activity in Olympia. And then our uh, we had meetings ready to go with legislators. We had our room. And then the night before I got a call saying, um, actually, we're going to take that room for some legislative meetings. So we uh, quickly uh, kind of went to plan B. Um, we met in the kind of the meeting space that's near the cafeteria um, and, and met there. And then we went and we were able to what's called like pull out members. They were on the floor all day, so that it was already kind of hard to get them for these brief meetings. And so we went and I sent in notes and um, and asked. So we were able to get a couple legislators out. Here in the picture on the right, you see Senator Claire Wilson, who's very instrumental in um, uh, bills around the population we serve. And she's just a, um, anyone who has met her knows how much energy, I mean, it, she was talking a mile a minute. You can see her energy even in the picture. Um, and you can see some of our PLT members um, gathered around. Um, we also snapped a picture, the one on the left on the steps. These are the, the, the Capitol steps facing the Temple of Justice. Um, and that was, I think, uh, done by the tour guide after we had a tour, which we did after um, you know our, our time spent um, in the hallways outside the chambers. Um, and then uh, kudos again to Don for, you know, having to scramble that night and make sure that the WASAC conference room was cleared out and available. So we moved to the afternoon to the WASAC conference room. We met with representatives from DCYF about their 
legislative priorities and we held our other meeting topics um, and had a had a good day. It was kind of like a day in the life in Olympia. So um, uh, thank you all who were able to make it for your uh, flexibility and willingness to jump in like that. <laughs> Kathy, thank you. Um, and next slide. So what happens next? Um, uh, we have the legislative session and then we have the legislative interim. So interim um, is happens after session ends. Um, and the first thing that we're waiting for is, although uh, it's easy to now say like, okay, session is done, technically we're not actually totally done until the, the, all the bills are signed, including the operating budget. So um, Governor Inslee will be signing that and they, they have, it, it, there's some rules on different things, but basically it's like you have 20 days. If after 20 days, um, since it was, it was signed, by, you know, done in the legislative process, if he weren't to sign it, it would automatically become law. If he were to do any, um, you know, line item vetoes, that there is also a process that to be overruled, but that's very, uh, that's quite rare. So anyways, the budgets get signed and then, then the state agencies, of course, have all these things they have to implement. So not exactly a, um, a like, a relaxing time for state agencies um, as all these different pieces need to be implemented. For advocates, this is the interim is the time to engage with your legislators and build relationships and also um, to work with legislators, with partners on legislation, whether it's existing legislation that um, that, that you want to promote, maybe um, maybe it didn't like like what we said before, it didn't pass and you want to keep working on it, um, or it could be new legislation. Um, and, you know, legislators at this, they just have more time because they're not in the middle of like meeting with a jillion people in 15 minute meetings, literally during session. But I've had meetings in the interim where it's like an hour and we're sitting over coffee and, or even like coming to one of our schools and um, you know, that would be early fall typically so they could see students. But um, so just really trying to emphasize the importance of this time period for um, for that more um, relationship building and thoughtful time to work on legislation and, and relationships. We already are starting to feel the impact of this of fall's elections. Um, there's a number of of legislators who are announcing they will not run again, and and a couple of those are pretty key legislators. For example, um, Senator Andy Billig from the Spokane area, who's a Senate Majority Leader, has announced he won't run again. So that's a big. Um, he's held an important role, and then that being Majority Leader is an important leadership role. Um, and um, also Senator Linda Wilson, who is um, ranking. And ways and means will not run again, and then there's there's others. There's also um, about half the Senate is up for re-election as well as House members. So it's going to look like a really different legislature come January after the elections and when they're all being sworn in. Um, and that means um, that means leadership changes, committee chairmanships change, new members to build relationships with. Um, and and you're off to the races with you know with the session starting. I dropped in the chat if you're interested the term expiration so you can see which of the senators are um, are up for re-election this year and maybe it's one that you're a constituent. Um, there's also in play um, a, a couple initiatives that will be on the ballot and if they pass, there's a financial impact. Um, so if you're interested in that, uh, we won't go into that due to time, but that is something that, um, is a real, um, is a real issue, um, and that you as voters will be making decisions on. So, um, Emily, anything to add, um, here? No, thank you. Okay, next slide. 
Um, this is a snapshot from our conference last year, Passport Conference. Um, but here is where uh, we would love to hear what questions or comments you have. If you could just raise your hand. And I am aware of the time. It looks like we only have a couple minutes left. So if we do happen to move on, please do continue to reach out to us or put questions in the chat and we'll get back to you. Yeah, Rosemary, please. Rosemary, did you hear me? I'd love to hear your question. Uh-oh, I see a message saying she can't unmute. Would you be able to put the question in the chat, Rosemary? Sorry about that. Technical difficulties. Yes. Well, I'm happy to look out in the chat in case you're able to put it there, or you can always reach out. Oh, here we go. Mm. I, I think um, the question is, how will the funding of Passport affect students applying this year? Um, I know that is uh, the number one priority for WASAC. And um, Don, would you like to take that question now? or? Um... Sure, yeah, I can, I'm happy to respond to that. Um, Rosemary, thanks. That that is truly the question that we all have. We you know we're all trying to figure out right now. What we're working on is coming up with some case scenarios, um, and we're going to be working with um, members of the passport leadership team to help us make some really difficult decisions. So right now um, we know that this is truly time sensitive because um, financial aid office financial aid administrators are trying to award students. Um, at this point in time, we really don't know what awards are gonna look like. I suspect that they're probably gonna be reduced and that they won't continue to be um, $5,000 just because like Juliet was saying earlier that the number of students continues to increase and um, the funding hasn't been able to keep pace with the, with the increase in students. So more information to come on that. Um, and we, we will, I just sent out um, messages to all of the Passport campus teams um, there was a message that was sent out late yesterday from Becky to all of the uh, financial aid administrators. Um, and then I also messaged the Passport leadership team as well. So more to come on that. And since we are at time, I'm just going to quickly go through our last, if you could go next slide, please. I want to make a pitch for you to um, sign up for our conference because registration is open as of today for our 2024 Passport to Careers conference. This year, it is a one-day virtual conference um, due to a number of factors, but we, we do have a really great um, agenda uh, for you. We have a great keynote. We have some amazing um, lived experience um, presenters who are going to be on a panel a number of workshops, including from a couple folks here, and um, and you won't want to miss it. I, I know there's a couple conflicts with other things, but I, I hope you can um, make it at least for part of the day. And so please do register. Love to see you there. And last slide. Uh, last slide is our contact information. Um, our our team is very dog friendly, so <laughs> so we just included our our uh, our furry our furry uh, colleagues in our home offices. Um, but yes, there's that. Um, there's our emails, our phone numbers. Um, Emily did share her personal information as Friday's her last day, and then those links are being shared in the chat. And um, then the sorry, Emily. Uh, are we speaking to okay? Um, yeah, I think. Um, thank you all so much for being here. I hope this was helpful. Um, if it did raise more questions, I uh, do reach out to us. And this is, you know, I I'm I'm here. Um, we will have more us. Uh, we will have more staff um, being joining the team shortly. So, reach out. Thank you for all you do. I mean, this is, you're doing the work that that's so important. So, 
uh, appreciate you and I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thanks everyone, have a great day. See you soon.